Uh, welcome to the uh, scanning the strange new worlds of Star Trek. We're going to be talking a little bit about our scanning division, how that relates to virtual production, and how we use that for Star Trek Discovery and Strange New Worlds. It's a little bit about us. Uh, myself, my name's Asad. I'm the head of VP content uh, over at Pixo. Uh, I'm Matej Koszowski. I'm the head of Capture in Pixo Mondo Toronto, and I handle all scans coming through our Canadian offices. And uh, my name is Wenrek Hanchens. I'm a CG supervisor dealing with both VP and the post VFX side of things. A little bit of what we've been up to this past year. Thank you. Webster's Dictionary defines virtual production. I'm just kidding. I won't, I won't do that to you. But um, yeah, um, everyone in this room is pretty intimately familiar with virtual production. Um, it's, it's pretty much all encompassing for anything that's production related where a game engine factors in. Uh, not to be confused with ICVFX or VAD, of course. Uh, just a quick overview of our stages. Uh, so Toronto number one, you're seeing on the left over there. That's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. Um, YTO2 that you see over there, that's our R&D stage, a little bit smaller. And YVR1, which is our Vancouver stage, <coughs> uh, which I believe is one of the largest, if not the largest in the world at the moment. And just real quick about VAD, um, pretty much anything covering the content creation aspect of our virtual production or ICVFX uh, projects, that's covered by the VAD department. So a brief definition of a VAD artist is, uh, is pretty much a generalist um, who's uh, taking uh, the asset from start to finish to rapid prototype um, concept art to kind of get a sign off uh, from the clients and uh, get, get production going on the, uh, on the build. And a little bit of the workflow. We're going from kind of a, an initial concept coming in from our client, which would be either Paramount Plus, CBS, um, heading over to two stages on the VAD side, which we're breaking up into visualization and realization. Visualization being the more conceptual side, realization being the technical optimization side, um, over to the stage review, followed by <laughs> the shoot prep and then the shoot day. 
all the while the physical build is going on. And in from a in from a scanning point of view, we are here multiple times. So we first time we come during the realization process. Uh, that's when we scan the props to be built uh, for our asset team. And then the second time is during the shoot prep when we scan for uh, alignment scan. That happens on a blend day if the environment needs it. And then the last time we shoot it, we scan on the shoot day or the day after, depending on the production needs. And that is a full coverage of the set that we shot on the virtual production stage. So for the equipment, this is our equipment that we use in the Toronto office. Uh, it fluctuates and we are basically a small division inside of a VFX house. So we also have one to three people depending on the project needs. The main part of the kit is our Fire LiDAR scanner. This is a Fire Focus 3D scanner that can reach up to 330 meters in distance uh, that can allow us to scan sets and locations very comfortably. Uh, from a photography point of view, we are using Canon R5, and we have a few custom items that we built as well, uh, such as cross-polarized setup for uh, capturing texture details. And what is great about the Canon uh, R5 is that it's a great hybrid, allowing us to capture videos such as like element shoots for fire or smoke. And we can also use it for HDRIs or DMP panoramas uh, because of the higher resolution that it can capture. A recent addition to our pack has been the PBR texture scanner I built down in the bottom right corner there. It's a pretty simple setup, but it's essentially a light hood uh, with eight LED strips on the inside that uh, I activate one by one, um, and in the top there, you can see there's room to place your camera and take a picture for each one. And uh, this allows us to take very high detailed albedo and normal maps um, that we use to augment uh, our assets. And um, yeah, super useful, especially for like uh, fabric or even, yeah, grounds or all kinds of textures. And it's, it's coming really handy. Yeah, and in this slide, I just want to explain kind of the techniques that we are using. You know, for those who are not familiar with it, LiDAR is basically a light measuring tool. Uh, it is used a lot in civil engineering for construction or uh, a lot of projects like that. Uh, we are using it for scanning sets, buildings, and basically any kind of uh, big locations that we do. Uh, it is very accurate, and basically the way it works is that uh, LiDAR is shooting a laser beam and calculates how long it took for the laser to come back to the unit. In that space, it will place a single point, and this happens millions of times during a single scan. We do multiple scans in one capture. Uh, so in the end, we will end up with these multiple million points of cloud, basically of uh, individual points in the 3D space that are accurately uh, uh, allowing us to see the 3D scene of it. Uh, this is called point cloud. This point cloud is then used for reconstruction of a 3D geometry. And for photogrammetry, it is basically from working on an algorithm based from a 2D images where the software calculates the point cloud for you. And from there, it's basically the same process as with the LiDAR. Uh, for LiDAR, we are using cloud compare to, cap to process the data and reality capture. And for photogrammetry, we are only using reality capture as it's the best in the market. What is great about photogrammetry is the level of detail you can get from both the geo and the texture detail of objects of any size, basically, which is something that LiDAR doesn't do as well, because if you have something very small, uh, it, it is limiting sometimes. And we scan props that are sometimes smaller than an apple. And uh, photogrammetry would be better in that case. Uh, so for Star Trek, we mainly cover props and location scans. For props, uh, the process would typically be that the props are built practically by the art department, and we are called in to do the scan to make a digital twin uh, in the asset department for in the VFX side, uh, or VAD side in these days. 
in here you can see an example of a probe that had a light inside of it uh, that was illuminating from within the probe. So this that one probe we scanned twice, uh, basically with the light off and then with the light on. This allowed the artist to use the two maps and see the difference between them and extract a mask that they could use for the actual asset that they built and replicate the illumination effect to one-to-one uh, -one matching the practical element. And they use these props in the extension of the set. So you couldn't see the difference between the one that are practical and the one that are on the wall. Essentially a free emission mask. <laughs> um, so a big part of uh, what we do is scanning large environments. As you can see here, we sent a team to Iceland. Um, I believe that was for season three. But um, what we do is we'll use drones to scan the large surface area and get the large forms of the terrain. And then on the ground in combination with LIDAR scans, we'll also do up close photogrammetry of patches. And um, we'll, we'll do multiple ones all over the surface area and we can use those to create different assets that we can use around our hotspot, which is where uh, the stage is. And then um, as well as extracting tons of texture information uh, from those images. So lots and lots of data is gathered to to rebuild these environments in full CG. And at the bottom there, you can see uh, uh, an example of where we had to place the Star Trek Discovery crashed into this giant glacier. And this uh, all this data was really, really invaluable to, to replicate and, and integrate our, our, uh, our crash site asset. And while we're talking a lot about, you know, kind of larger productions, there are always, you know, shortcuts that you can take if you're on a budget, if you're on an indie production. Um, this is just one example of, you know, just, just a, an example pipeline here where we're taking an iPhone over to reality scan through maybe a little bit of cleanup in Blender if you need to. Um, and then just turning that into an FBX and throwing it into the engine. Um, every step in that process is free except the iPhone. Uh, and uh, actually what you're seeing on the bottom left over here is an example of one of those shortcuts. So <clears throat> one plugin that I kind of feel goes overlooked um, and it's been around for, for a while in vanilla Unreal is the Point Cloud plugin. Uh, so this footage that you're seeing is from back in the day, 4.18. Uh, one of our crew had, um, actually Chris Chinea, had gone in and scanned our entire studio um, one day, and we were able to just bring that kind of raw data into the engine. If you just throw in some cubes and turn that into Collision Geo, uh, it's a playable game right off the bat, just kind of using the uh, third person template. So that entire process is about two, maybe three days. Um, but yeah, uh, that just goes to show that while there are larger shows like this, happening and taking like maybe months or, or a year to produce, um, there are shortcuts and, uh, and really inexpensive solutions along the way for, for any kind of smaller projects that you're into. And over to some case studies. So one of the first environments we were tasked to build for our virtual production wall was the Moonlit Mausoleum for uh, um, Star Trek Discovery. And this was an environment uh, briefed to us as a giant underground cavern um, covered with these uh, alien pods that are placed in the circular pattern and um, had these giant structures carved out of marble. Um, and the way we approach this um, from the beginning is just to get sign off from the, from the client to uh, general composition and, and direction they wanted to go. We started building um, these very basic base geometry um, forms. And um, once the client kind of signed off on that, we uh, brought that base geometry into Houdini and with the help of uh, Megascan's maps, um, displaced that geometry and created high-resolution geometry from that. 
We then exported that out of Houdini and op before optimizing it, and then um, bringing that into Engine, and that was the main driving force for our uh, for our cavern. The asset team had um, built the the structures and the pods based on the client's concept art, which you can see on the sides, and uh, a lot of. Yeah, real-world textures were used to texture these assets and um, and uh, get it to a photorealistic look. And from scanning point of view, we were mainly focused on the props for the egg uh, items. This was actually the first prop that we scanned for the virtual production uh, in the in Toronto office. So these props, these eggs were scanned with both uh, LiDAR and uh, photogrammetry techniques. We, texture, we captured a lot of texture detail for the department to use as a, as a reference. And this process was done in the method that I mentioned before, so that we would be called in after the prop is finished and we would scan it. Uh, however, this process doesn't have to be always this way and it not always is. So if the schedule is tight or the process uh, can be lengthy to build on the asset side. We can come in and scan the prop when it's been assembled but not textured yet. So we would scan it just for the geometry, process it, give it to the asset team to start their build. And then we would come back once the art department finishes with the prop and finishes the texturing and the painting of it. And we would scan it again, scan it again update the scans, update it to the asset department, and they would finish the final asset that would be on the stage. And sometimes it can happen, I think it believe, I believe it happened here as well with this environment, that uh, we used some of these scans directly in the engine as well. Yeah, um, no processing necessary for, for a few of those. Um, you're, what you're seeing on the right over here is an example of the process being flipped. So that's kind of one of the interesting things uh, we've been finding with the advent of VAD and virtual production is that since we're coming in so early in the timeline now, it used to be that a prop is built, and then you scan it, and you're kind of locked in. Um, however, what you're seeing on the right there in the Kaminar council chamber environment, if you look uh, just behind these characters, there's kind of this ornate, intricate sculpture going on, but like just behind them. Um, kind of the interesting part of this process was, <coughs> excuse me, just the uh, back and forth between ourselves and the client about just the material, what's What's this going to be made of? Is it going to be wood, pewter metal, gold? Um, and it's a back and forth of what's easy for you guys to build on the practical side, which is normally the case. But now it's also a factor of what's easy to achieve photorealism on the engine side. So then you kind of meet in the middle and you end up with what we ended up with here, uh, which is a pewter metal finish. Yeah, and after the, all the elements are built, uh, the stage is, is then transported into our virtual production stage. This one is in Toronto, and this is the first setup we had for the Moonlet environment. And funny enough, um, one of the earliest environments uh, was quite complex right out the gate. You can see there's kind of this intricate pattern going on on the floor, which, you know, if, if you've worked in virtual production before, you have to blend the digital with the practical. The more intricate that practical set is, the more complex this whole thing is going to be. Um, so there's the pattern, right? But there are also these steps, which then have to line up with um, a digital step, which is elevated. Um, so all the more reason to have the highest fidelity scan that you can get, uh, bring out the Faro scanner. And that way, when you bring it into the engine, <clears throat> throw the textures on it, um, you can kind of get 80 to 90% there with um, just the block in and placement of your end display setup. And then when you get to the set on the day, just kind of finessing that and finalizing it. Uh, so this just kind of makes that entire process uh, quite a bit easier. And to elaborate a little bit on the left side, so that is a final scan that, would, that we would capture on the shoot day with the LiDAR. Uh, there is no photogrammetry in that geometry, but we would these days we would color this scan with the photos from uh, the camera as we do the LiDAR, uh, just so we can get the highest possible texture detail of the set. And here you can see the final shot and a bit of a breakdown. 
But funny enough, with this one, um, this was, I think, the third or fourth environment that we had done for ICVFX at Pixamondo. Um, and it's, of course, it's going to be a scary process for anyone that's kind of just starting and getting into this industry. Um, so it was really nice to see uh, how seamless the blend was, <coughs> for one thing. Um, so seamless, in fact, that on the day, we nearly had one of the talent actually walking into the wall because, you know, it's, it's that much of a seamless blend. And that's how we kind of knew that, like, okay, this is definitely going to work. We can do this. Let's do the rest of these environments. Yeah, and another big, one of the big parts for scanning is match move use. They are actually using the scans that we give them the most of the, all the other departments. Uh, they needed to track the cameras and to solve the match move. Uh, for virtual production, it is very tricky sometimes, especially when you work with anamorphic lenses, which both of these projects use. Uh, you can't track the actual content on the virtual production wall because uh, there is a latency lag between the screen and the camera, and it also changes because of the volume shape and the curvature of it. So they are relying on the scans to give them a lot of information that they would have to solve the other without it, basically. Uh, so here you don't have to solve depth because the LiDAR would, will give you the accurate 3D information so you know how the depth is in the scene. And if even if you have a little parallax, like in this shot, for example, you can still solve a successful camera track. And what you can, what you, what are you looking at here is uh, actually one of our QC passes. So this would be a quality check that uh, Match Move is checking on against the plate, and that's why the lidar scan is in the wireframe mode. And for this, they need a lower resolution so they can see through the lidar and see the plate behind it. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if anybody here has ever processed scans in reality capture. Sometimes you end up with a lot a lot of geo. And that can become tricky inside the pipeline, um, depending on which department is using it. In this case, uh, match move. Um, and we like to provide different levels of detail for this geometry. Usually we go a high, mid, low when these things get published out into the pipeline. In this case, the match move would use the low one to make the review process uh, Readable. Imagine throwing, you know, a 10, 15 million polygon geometry in here. It would just look like a white blob. So, um, so this allows us to really be able to check the tracks, make sure that all the points are locked onto what they need to be locked onto. And then as well, this lower res geometry can be used in layout to help the team there place any other CG props or characters or ships or anything within the scene. Um, in this case, it was our digital egg asset. And this really helps keep things moving smoothly through the pipeline and, and really makes, makes happy artists. Yeah, and for example, if you have a set that this oral location scan, that is 50 million po polygons as a row, uh, for match move, it can go as low as maybe 100,000 triangles or lower than that. So it's heavily decimated. And it helps with the optimization when they load it into the scene so that their machine doesn't crash. Uh, so they can just load up only the low if they need it to preview it and to work with it as they need. And if someone needs higher resolution, let's say there is a too much decimation on, they would use the one version up, which would be the mid in this case. Uh, we are also, the big big part for scans in virtual production is the alignment, which we mentioned previously. So these scans are done usually on a blank day, which is one or two days before the actual shoot. Uh, they are meant to target a specific goal that or a problem that we are facing. Uh, usually that is communicated to us prior so that we know what we can focus on and what areas we can skip. Uh, it is needed in this environment for the floor. Basically, there is this uh, complex pattern of the FedHQ floor that needs to seamlessly extend to the LED volume. As you can see, that black line in the middle of the image, that's the uh, ex extension, I believe. And 
uh, we can use the scan to align uh, basically on the, the rivets of the floor segments. We can see them in the scan and then drive it in the Unreal Engine to adjust our scene to make it more seamless. Yeah, so um, this is another one of those unforgiving blends where you have a super flat surface, for one thing, and then you have not so much an intricate pattern in this case, like we saw in the mausoleum, but a high contrast one. So precision is still a factor here. Um, so what we end up with is <coughs> kind of a, of course, a scan, as always, of the floor. Um, that is then processed by assets, <coughs> excuse me, uh, into a texture, a seamlessly tileable texture. So this entire setup is pretty much shader driven, what you're seeing um, in the Federation HQ shuttle bay. Um, so this is kind of a world space projection for a texture uh, in which we are manipulating that uh, just with some offsets, um, a scale, and um, some rotation controls over here. So we can get very close to it in engine before we go to the blend. During that blend, we can actually look at it in camera, dial it in by eye for that last little bit of, of millimeter accuracy through that shader. Yeah. And of I, course, you don't need to rebake the scene with that method, so uh, another reason to use the shader yeah. solution there. Usually it is used if on blend they find out that uh, it's not matching correctly and they need even extra detail to match it, then we would scan it for the alignment. And we need to process it ASAP, so if we can skip certain areas of detail or uh, skip something that we don't need to capture, it saves time in both processing and the capturing stage and we give it to the Unreal team ASAP, so usually th within the same day. So if we scan at lunchtime, uh, let's say 1 p.m., by 5 p.m. they already have the scan processed of the full stage and they can use it for what they need to make changes because sometimes the change is needed by morning the next day for the shoot. And digital doubles, oftentimes, uh, mostly for post VFX, we are tasked uh, to augment in characters. And oftentimes for establishers, you know, really wide shots and that, um, yeah, we, we need to put these in. So what we'll do, we'll often get from uh, the client uh, in this case, is they have scanned these characters through uh, a character rig with a multi, you know, DSLR setup, um, super fancy. But we'll get that data and we'll process it. And uh, we'll generate these low resolution models. And um, the assets team will use the scan data to drive the, the color maps and the models uh, in this case. And um, and yeah, the rigging team will pick this up and do some really kind of rough rigs. Oftentimes, these digital doubles are pretty small in frame. Um, it depends, you know, we have done hero ones, which obviously takes a bit more time and a bit more finessing, um, but it's all depending on distance to camera. So in this case, they were fairly small and we were able to do these fairly low res meshes and uh, yeah, rigging just picked them up. As you can see here, like we didn't even, you know, do any cloth sims or anything. Uh, we just rigged them as is. They were they weren't moving a lot, so we we were, it was pretty forgiving. And then as well as uh, props, just doing uh, a a quick scan of those, just running it through ZBrush, getting um, uh, some UVs on it, bake those textures, and then we'll just do basic shaders to to get us what we need. And if we have any locations or like set scans that we receive from the vendors, they are usually coming in as raw, so they are very heavy. And it basically just goes through the decimation process for our individual LOD, so that will be the high, mid, or low, uh, which is much more for other departments are used to using. Uh, because from whatever, depending on the vendor it's coming from, it will always be a bit different. So we always also fix the orientation or the position of it or the scale to whatever we need. And um, actually, if you go back for oh, one sorry. second, um, one of these, um, so these elements that you're looking at uh, are, are more coming in handy in our current productions as well for things like crowd simulations and crowd work. Um, while a lot of times you can go with <clears throat> 2D elements to create things like this, if you need a volume of crowds or a dynamic lighting affecting those crowds, uh, scans like these really come in handy 
um, through something like Niagara in Unreal, simulating a crowd that way. And uh, another case study is for our Strange New Worlds environment, Velo Beta. So here we actually chose a little bit different approach. So we try to use miniature in virtual production and how it would work with it. Uh, we had a shoot with a VFX supervisor where we captured a lot of references, a lot of uh, different lighting setups for the miniature. Be because it was ice, it was very uh, interesting to see the different angles of the light. We had a small black room where we could uh, see, like control the lighting. And after we shot all the references we needed, we would scan the whole miniature. And the scan was then used by the VAD team as a base to build upon the entire scene, as well as layout used it. Uh, yeah, the scan was then handed over to our asset department and uh, they used the various passes to drive the shaders. And the nice thing about doing a controlled shoot like this is we were able to adjust the lighting while keeping the camera locked off. So we were essentially creating real life passes. And this was really informative to our asset artists because we were uh, getting really good information on how the light was refracting through these surfaces. And when you're essentially backlighting this thing and turning all the other lights off, you have a refraction pass. So we were able to not only provide this to our asset department, but also to our digital map painting department who helped us develop various other assets and background assets on cards. And um, they were able to split this out and dial things in on the fly. And we, um, we yeah, we kept things kind of fluid that way, as well as, um, yeah, using these, uh, these masks to drive the shaders and the look dev of the, of the ice. And actually on the engine side, we kind of took a page from how the scanning team was doing it and uh, set up something similar. So uh, this was back in 427. Um, Refraction, subsurface scattering are, of course, tricky to do in an engine while keeping the scene performant, especially when the entire scene is made of ice, right? So um, what we could do in this case was take a few <coughs> individual ice shards, render them in isolation just as a 2D element, and do what I suppose you could call it like kind of an inverse Medusa rig, essentially a light that's just circling around this asset and rendering out a bunch of frames of different refraction passes. Uh, you can throw that into a blueprint through just <coughs> an array of uh, textures and then just quickly cycle through those textures as an artist. So you can place a shard, cycle to a texture, place a shard, cycle to a texture, and um, kind of just iterate really quickly that way and get the fidelity that you need while keeping the performance since all those elements are 2D and relatively malleable that way. And just a little tip, if you would ever go down this way with miniature, try to build it as big as you can because we didn't think of it initially, but we built it a little bit smaller. It was like two meters by two meters, I, I, I assume. Uh, we had a lot of issues with blending the individual depth of field passes. So we had to shoot the same for like three or four times and then blend it. So we have a clean pass, uh, which was quite a pain. So if you can avoid that, avoid it. And um, as you can see, Star Trek, the universe of Star Trek loves reflective elements and reflective probes, glasses, and anything black is great. Uh, for scanning, we don't feel the same way. It's actually the worst thing that you can have, especially for the black uh, and the reflections. So if you have something black and you try to scan it with a LiDAR, uh, you don't get the reflection of the beam. So it would be a bit noisy. It's the same as water. It would reflect it somewhere else. Uh, with photogrammetry, if you are scanning something um, with reflections, as you are moving around it, the lights reflect and move around the object as well, which will give you a lot of noise in your geometry or holes, and basically it will prevent you of getting a good scan. So for this, the what is usually used in the industry are these uh, scanning sprays, what we all also use. So we use these ISUP sprays from Germany. We actually use the blue one. And uh, that one is special in a way that it dissolves in the air. So you don't have to clean up the prop or whatever object that you sprayed with, with it. 
Uh, this is crucial for us because production doesn't allow us to put powder or like if you have baby powder or something like that, that you need to clean up later. Uh, oftentimes we scan these props before they are filmed. So if we damage them or don't clean them up properly, uh, we would be in trouble and probably I wouldn't get another prop to scan ever. So uh, these dissolving sca sprays, uh, scanning sprays uh, help us a lot and at least we will get a nice geometry from it. So this, for example, this was one of the ice, ice uh, crystals for the Velo Beta environment. Uh, we scanned it as a reference for the artist to use because they were scattered, scattered across the volume. So we needed to match something close to it in the in our extension. Uh, this, this probe we would scan twice. So I would scan it once before I sprayed it just to get some color of it. Then I would apply the spray, scan it again, and with the data set from the, uh, the sprayed uh, capture, I would re reconstruct the geometry and then I would texture it with the first pass of, of the scanning, so without the spray. And in the end, you would get a bit blended because there are the reflections in it. So you get a blended view of it, but at least it would give some kind of information to the artist where things are. If there is a detail, let's say a scratch mark or uh, something in the texture, they would at least, even if it's not uh, perfectly sharp, they would at least know where it is and where to correctly place it if they are projecting from another texture data set, like a texture detail photos that we supply them. As you can see here, um, this was one of those cases where we were kind of limited to what we could do on set. And um, unfortunately, as everybody knows, giant big boxes of flame underneath really expensive LED panels turned out to be a big no-no. So, so that's where it kind of fell on us to augment these shots with these giant uh, kind of, yeah, flaming boxes on top. So um, what Mate did is on the day he had scanned the set, including these practical pillars that were limited in height, obviously due to the nature of the stage. And um, we extracted those pillars out of the scan and we um, we processed them and generated high res uh, albedo maps, which then were provided to our asset department. And this was not only um, invaluable to build these things, but also to texture them as well and to seamlessly blend them into the practical set. And if you have something like this, it, it comes up a lot when uh there is something on set that there is a creative decision made on the actual shoe that wasn't planned before. So for example, a prop like this maybe wasn't uh, flagged to be scanned initially, but then we need to make the extension because of the creative decisions made on the day. So the scan from the shoot day always allows us to go back and view everything as it was when they shoot it, and we can extract whatever we need for the post VFX uh, production. And real quick, just talking about the future, I want to give you t time for some questions. But um, Nanite at Pixo um, is currently in use. <clears throat> uh, we moved to Unreal 5 a little while back for production. Um, so looking forward to just bringing scans straight into the engine with, with far less processing even more often than we did before. Um, Digi doubles, like we mentioned, crowds. If you check out the um, stadium commercial uh, by Pixo on the sizzle reel, just an example of like a stadium of dynamically lit uh, characters driven through Niagara, um, more things like that, just higher fidelity um, for those crowds, and uh, a little bit of scouting, like in one of the shows that we hadn't mentioned here, um, Halo, for example, we're working with a very large scan of just a giant quarry area, for example, um, for one of the fight sequences, and um, the kind of higher fidelity that you can get with scans like those, uh, you know, the more use you can make out of it. That was actually a like, uh, special case because that was during COVID. So what happened is that they wanted to shoot in that location, uh, let's say in March, and then it got halted for the production. And during that halt, uh, we were still able to get the scan of it, uh, process it, give it to the director, and he could 
view it in Unreal, go in VR and plan his shoot as he was there, plan the sequence, even though it was months ahead. And then they would return to the location when everything was planned and uh, they would shoot it. Another use for the scouting is uh, what we had during COVID is that uh, some productions needed to scan the film lot they were going to shoot because they needed to plan how, when we will resume shooting, how they are going to come back, where will they place the trucks, how much space they will have, and how they can social distance people around the lot. And basically, they use the scan to uh, map all that out. And uh, pruning props, I said, uh, I basically mentioned that in the last slide, which is basically the ability of extracting uh, any geo that is in the set physically used that wasn't previously scanned. And we can reuse that for any post VFX that we have. But yeah, um, that's what we've got for you today. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening. And thank you, Epic, for, for putting this together. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>